1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance. As we know what manner of men, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Father, I ask you, Lord, for a little bit of guidance here this morning, Father. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for your salvation. Lord, I thank you for the call you've put upon my life and the ability to do it. Lord, it's not always the way I would like to, but Lord, we like to see you move and see you work through our lives and change lives. And Father, we're thankful for that, thankful for this church that supports our ministry and helps us keep going down the road and helping other veterans along the way. Lord God, help us this morning. Look into your word. Help us to understand and to hear with our heart as well as our ear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I was thinking, there's a, there's a lot of things that people like to brag about. Amen? Amen? Otherwise, you wouldn't have a Guinness Book of World Records. Amen? The tallest man, the tallest woman, the shortest man, the shortest woman. There's a lot of things we like. I like to brag about the Lord. Amen? Here we're told in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only. What if we only had a Bible? What if all you had was a Bible? You didn't have a preacher. You didn't have a place to come and assemble. You didn't have other Christians to affiliate with. What if all you had was a Bible? That's the way most people are in these Muslim countries. All they have is a little bit of Scripture. Matter of fact, I have been told that when Bibles are sent over there and given to a Christian that used to be a Muslim, they will tear them up so they can share them with one another. And we've got four or five of them sitting around the house. Amen? One of the things the Taliban is doing is if you have the Bible on your phone, they're killing you. They hate America because we brought the gospel there. I'm not saying the politics was any, was any good. There's no reason why we should ever walk out on people. But I'm telling you, the Word of God is why we were there. Amen? To get the gospel. I'm not telling you the military is religious. They're not. Well, actually, they're religious. They're just not saved. Amen? But there's enough Christians in the military that are willing to take the gospel over there that they could plant the seeds so those missionaries could go. Amen? But Paul, he, he says here, For our gospel came not to you in word only. If all you had was the Bible, would you be the Christian you are today? Amen? He says, but secondly, but also in power. In power. We travel this country, and I know you do too, preacher, and you get in churches, and it's like you're speaking to the... There, there's, there's pews are full, and you're speaking to the four walls. You walk out of there, and they wouldn't know God if he walked in and started preaching himself. Amen? You walk into some other churches and maybe they're not as full and maybe they're not as big and, and maybe they're not as prestigious as the one you were just at. But son, I'm telling you what, that person gets up and they start singing a song and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost starts moving and the preacher doesn't even get to preach. The Holy Ghost is there. He shows up. Before you know it, you got someone getting saved over here. you got a family over here that hated that family over there. They're getting right with God with power. What's missing in our pulpits today is the power of the Holy Ghost of God. He says, we're not going to just... We didn't just give you the gospel in word only, but we want to give it to you. We want you to see that it came in power. There's a power behind the gospel. There's preachers all over this country that preach from a book, but they don't preach with power. Son, I'm glad long time ago I got straightened out on that line because I was on that other line for a long time amen I love it when God moves in and the Holy Ghost moves in he says not only with power but power in the Holy Ghost and you can have dictatorial power my brother who served in Iraq we were having a discussion the other day 
And he said, uh, he was, was talking about government and everything, and he said, they don't have the power to do what they're doing. I said, wrong answer. They have the power, they don't have the authority. There's a difference. Amen? Our power comes from the Holy Ghost of God. Our power comes from God. The authority comes from God. Amen? That's where the power comes from. But they're using a strange power. Our governments today are doing whatever they want. They're ignoring your vote. You don't matter anymore. That's a dictator. Amen? This gospel was taken to the Thessalonians with power from on high. When the power of God is present, you'll see it. Man, I've been in some meetings where you could take a butter knife and slice it into quarters. I love it. Amen? Where a young man that walked out three years before laid his Bible on the altar and said, I'll never come to church again. I'll never hear about God again. And all of a sudden, he sees a... <laughs> Glory. <laughs> he sees a three-year-old boy walk up to the preacher during the preaching. Preach, preacher, preach! Preach, preacher, preach! Preach, preacher, preach! And got convicted. Yeah. All he was there was to cook for us. <laughs> and he got cooked. The Holy Ghost got him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. With power in the Holy Ghost. We got afraid of that for a long time. Because of the charismatic movement. Listen, folks, if you don't understand the moving of the Holy Ghost, I've got three men that mentored me. One taught me doctrine. Important. The baseline. Uh, uh, the basics, if you will. Amen? One taught me how to work with people and get them to work with you. He taught me administration. Important. But the third one taught me how to trust the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? To know when... To do what and how to do it. You gotta learn how to trust the Holy Spirit of God. You can come up here to this altar all you want to, and you're not gonna get saved until the Holy Ghost is involved in it. Amen. You can go out and knock on somebody's door and go witness to them all they want all you want to, but until the Holy Ghost is in it, they're not gonna change their life. We need to understand that there is a power that comes from the Holy Ghost of God that works through us. It is not me. It is not you. It is the power of the Holy Ghost of God. I have seen people raised. Uh, uh, there was a soldier several years ago that was pronounced clinically dead. They still had him on the machines. The machines were breathing for him. They said his brain's dead. His body's not functioning if it wasn't for the machines. I'm bragging on God this morning, not me. Right. I walked in there with his dad, who was a preacher, a Baptist preacher. His dad stood on one side of the other, and I stood on the other side. And I said, he had, he had given me a challenge coin that his sergeant major in Iraq had given him. And I stuck it back in his hand, and I said, Mo, I don't feel like I'm making much of a difference, because that's what he told me when he gave it to me. He says, you're making a difference. Don't quit praying for me. I stuck it back in his hand. I said, I don't feel like I'm making much of a difference. And he squeezed my hand. That was the first sign of life in four and a half days. I prayed and I said, Lord, if it'll glorify you, will you please give him one more chance to get saved? And he laid there for two more days. Nothing changed. But in those two days, my wife led his sister, about 30 years old, 30 years of age, to the Lord in the hospital waiting room at 15 minutes after midnight, praise God. And that same day, preacher, at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, that Thursday afternoon, he sat up in bed and said, I'm hungry. When can I go home? Yeah. That's not me, that's God. That's the type of power that comes from the Holy Ghost. That's the evidence that comes from the Holy Ghost of God. We not only have the Word of God, but we have the power and the authority of the Word of God. Through the Holy Ghost of God. What a blessing that is. But I want to get to this last one. This one blesses me. <laughs> and in much... Assurance. Did you ever do something and want a little bit of assurance that it was the right thing to do? Have you ever done that? We do that all the time, don't we? By the way, what's the assurance of your salvation? Hey, man. I tell you what the assurance of your salvation is. If it didn't change you, you ain't saved. Hey, man. 
Whenever I talk to someone about the Lord and, and, and they pray and they ask Christ to receive him, I said, now you know there's a test after this, right? They get all nervous. What do you mean there's a test? The test is whether you're going to change your life or not. Whether you're going to let God change your life or not. Amen? Whether you're going to have a desire for the Word of God to read it. Whether you're going to have a desire to come to church and worship the Lord God. Whether you're going to have a, be obedient into baptism, allowing yourself to be baptized into the local church. Whether you're going to be a, 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 a willing to serve God in whatever aspect He calls you to do. That's a test, man. That's the assurance of your salvation. You're here this morning not because you want to show off the fancy dress or the fancy suit you got on. You're here this morning because you want to worship God as an assurance of your salvation. Right. Amen. I talk to preachers and I've met a few like this and I've met too many that I want to mention, but uh, that tell me, you know, we, we had a revival last week and we won 2,000 people to the Lord. I said, man, that church ought to be packed. No, they got, we baptized about two of them. Where's the assurance? Where's the assurance? Amen. Assurance is evidence. Amen. That's in a court of law. That's the word they use for evidence is the word of assurance. Where's the evidence? It's funny that you mentioned our motorhome sitting out there in the parking lot. Last time we was here, we was in a 1998 Damon Challenger. It was white. And it was breaking down more than it was running. Amen. And we got fed up with it. Last year, we was in North Carolina. We went to a meeting over on the east side of northern part of North Carolina. And on the way back to the uh, Concord, the air suspension quit working. The running lights quit working. The tail lights quit working. The headlights quit working. And about a half a dozen other things that were already wrong and I hadn't gotten fixed yet. And I said, I'm done. I ain't taking this thing any further. It's too unsafe. Amen. There's certain things you got to have when you're traveling up and down these roads. Amen. The right lights is one of them, especially in a thunderstorm, because just as the lights went out, a thunderstorm rolled in. It got just as black as midnight. And I said, great, now all I need is a cop to come by. State patrolman come right by me. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, Lord, let him get off. He took the next exit. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> we have been praying for seven years for a newer motorhome. We don't have a house someplace. We live in what you see out there. Amen? You li we lived in, in that other one for 10 years. We called it the hallway. It was 33 foot long and 8 feet wide. Most of you got a bedroom bigger than that. But we lived in that thing for 10 years. We've been praying for 7 of those years for a newer motorhome. A diesel pusher. Our old one's breaking down. It's giving up on us. And I'm praying, and I started fasting about it. And I started praying a little bit harder, a little bit more fervently. I said, Lord, you put us out here in this ministry. You put us out here on the road. You told me you'd provide for our needs. Why can't we have a new motorhome? Be careful what you ask. I didn't like the answer I got back. God answered back, you're praying wrong. Did we need a new motor home? Amen? Sure we did. But I was praying wrong. I said, Lord, how am I praying wrong? He says, you're praying for a diesel. You don't need one. So he gave us a V10 Triton. It runs from gas station to gas station. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, we get about the same mileage with this one we did with the last one, to be honest with you. I said, okay, Lord. The very next day, we went to an RV dealership not too far from us. And they showed us an RV that they had. And I crawled up underneath it as best as I could. 
and there was rust on the U-joints. That told me how long it had been since that thing was used. That's a problem going someplace to happen. I said, Lord, this ain't the one. I worked my way out and took me about 15 minutes to get back up on my feet. I looked at the guy and I said, don't you have anything else? He says, yeah, we got one that we just got in about four days ago. We ain't even looked at it. I said, can we look at it? He said, sure. I'm telling you what, if this was the lot, this was the back lot, the thing was parked right here along the fence on the back corner. There were six RVs here, and there was four more on the other side of it, blocking it in. The FBI couldn't have found it if it was on the top most wanted list. They had that thing hid. He got three or four of them RVs moved, pulled that thing out, and slid the slides out, and we began to look at it, and it had the exact layout we'd been praying for. It had exact colors that we wanted on the outside. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. But the biggest hurdle that kept us from getting a new motor home is that we are missionaries and I don't have a W-2 form. And banks don't like that. Guy says, are you, do you want it? I said, yeah. And we negotiated a price. I said, now, can you get us financed? He called me back an hour later and had six companies want to finance us. What about that? I said, amen. So we put our deposit down on it. They kept it for about seven days and cleaned it up and everything and supposedly fixed everything that was broke on it. You move your house down the road every other week and see how many problems you got. <laughs> I went home and I asked the Lord... Listen to this, for a little assurance. What did he say he'd give us right here through the word of God? What did he say in verse 5? And much assurance. I'm trying to get someplace here. I'm not just telling you a story. I asked for a little assurance that we did the right thing. The next day, a preacher from down by London, Kentucky called me up and that was not a supporter of our ministry. He called me up and he said, Brother Kidman, I had posted on Facebook, praise God, we finally got a new RV. I didn't ask for nothing. I was just praising God, thanking God for the vehicle he gave us. The next day, that preacher called me up and he said, Brother Kidman, I see you got a new RV. I said, yes, sir. He said, I'd like to make your first payment. I said, well, praise God. That's a little assurance, wouldn't you say? Amen. Amen. So he sent us a check for the first month's payment. The next week, a preacher in North Carolina called me up and he says, Hey, I got a check here for you. It was the next two payments besides that one. That's a little assurance, wouldn't you say? The next week, I got two more checks in the mail for five more payments. Are we getting good yet? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! We had eight months' payments in the bank before the first one was due. That's a little assurance. But as Paul Harvey says, we ain't done yet. Now the rest of the story. During those eight months, we made payments. During those eight months, people kept sending us checks. I never asked for a dime. I only asked the Lord for a little assurance. The day after the eighth payment was made, we paid it off. <laughs> Woo! God paid for that thing in eight months. That's a little assurance. Are you following me? That's just, I asked for a little assurance. We, get, we look at that and think, man, that's an amazing thing. That's a, wow, man, what if God did that for me? We think of all the glory and everything of that, of, of God moving like that financially. Say, man, why doesn't God do for them, man, for me? Because you're asking for much assurance, and all He wants to give you is a little. Amen? 
What did, ha, this thought came to me, what did Solomon ask for? A little wisdom. Amen? God gave, made him the wisest man on the earth. We get caught up in asking God to do the great, and we're not satisfied with the little. And he tells us right here, he says, And in much assurance ye know. I'm telling you what, I asked for a little bit of assurance, and God blessed my heart beyond what I can handle. i got to tell people about it. Because I didn't do it. Amen? Not even the down payment that we put down wasn't our money. We had churches before we bought it sending us $1,000 towards our motorhome. All I asked for was a little assurance. But God said through His Word, through the Holy Spirit, through the power and through the Holy Spirit of God, we can have much assurance that the Word of God is true, that the power of Almighty God is true. Hey, we get caught up in the temporal things. Yeah, I'm glad it's paid for, but that's temporal. That's going to burn up in a fire one day, amen? That's going to rot and it's going to rust. It's got problems already. Brother Pete had to come out and help me with one yesterday. Thank God. But it's just a vehicle. What about your salvation? God has given you much assurance on your salvation and you sit in your blessed pew and do very little with it. Oh, we're there on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, if the ball game's not on. I know I'm preaching to the choir. You're here for Sunday school. But somebody else is going to listen to this message. We got the greatest assurance we ever got, and that is the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of us. That is the assurance of your salvation. And the Bible says it's much assurance. Much assurance. Whew. Look in verse 6, and we'll close. And you became followers of us, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Here's the reason I believe we need this message this morning. What you're seeing in Afghanistan is coming here. You're not going to be able to meet in this building. There's a time coming, and it's coming fast. Is the assurance of your salvation going to keep you during, tribu during turbulent times. Well, we can shout about that motorhome being paid for. But how many of us are shouting about the fact that one day we're going to stand? And your Christianity is going to have to show out that you're not afraid to give your life for the Master. I've got enough assurance, I believe I can do that. Amen. Amen? I believe I can do that. You say, Brother Kibben, how do you know? You know. One thing, I know this is real. Amen? One thing, I know the Holy Ghost inside me is real. Another thing I know is that the God who gave it all to me is real. <laughs> Son, that's as real as it gets. As a combat veteran, I tell people all the time, I live in two worlds. I live in this world, and every night when I go to sleep, I end up back over there. Wake up in the morning, what was you dreaming about? I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to remember. Can I tell you something? There is a world that is far more real than what you're living in right now. That is in the presence of Almighty God. And listen, friend, if you're not born again and the Holy Ghost is dealing with you, you need to get that thing settled this morning. Because there is a world that you're going to miss out on that is far more real than this world. 
This world is temporal. This world will burn up in a fire. This world is going to be destroyed. And everything that you've ever built, everything that you've ever done is going to be gone in this world. But it's time to start building in that which is not temporal, and that which is spiritual, and that which is godly, and that which is holy. It's time to start building in that world what God has given us to build, the tools He's given us to build with. It's time to get out and present the gospel, and share the gospel, and reach others for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ, is what Paul said. Get on board and get serving. Father, we love you. We thank you, dear God, for your grace and your mercy. And ask you, dear Lord, to bless the rest of the services today. God, strengthen your people and courage and help, Father, through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.